Okay, friends, if you can find your spot again, that would be really awesome. All right, our kindergarten through second graders can make their way to the back to Mr. J. He's ready for children's church, so kindergarten through second grade, go ahead and head on back. Walking. I know. You got you to gotta remind them. Um, so welcome. Um, I want to thank you guys for coming today. I'm Emily Townley. I lead out in children's ministry, which is awesome. If you are a guest, will you reach in front of you, and there's a nifty, difty little card that looks like this. Um, we'd love for you to fill it out and put it in the offering plate. That way we can pray for you. We can get you a little bit of information. Um, we can get to know you. So I hope you can do that. Um, I have one of my awesome friends who is up here, and she's going to pray for us in a minute. Um, Pastor Griff is finishing up Luke chapter 16 today, so I'm excited to hear about it. I know you are. And this is Jennifer Brunn. She also helps in our childhood ministry, and she's an awesome teacher. So, Good morning, everybody. Thank you for being here. My name is Jennifer Brands, as Emily said. My family and I have been with Waterloo for about five years. We decided with Waterloo just the first time we came, it felt like home. We let after we went for a few weeks, the Lord just said, this is where you're supposed to be. There, there's things that we have for you here. There's people we want you to know. So that's why we call Waterloo home here. So um, I'm excited for this sermon. So I came to early service. So I, I'm really excited for you guys to hear it. It's a really good one. So if you guys will just bow your heads with me and I'll pray. Heavenly Father, I just lift, lift our servant Griff up. May each one of us here, may we just open our hearts and our minds as, as his word, as he speaks your words. And may we just listen to your message. It's a really good message. It was a very moving message today, Lord. Lord, I just pray that each one of us will open our hearts and our minds. And may we just can use these words that Griff will speak today and just use them in our walk with you. Lord, I lift up those that have the needs. You know better than I do what those are. I lift each, each and every one of them up. In your heavenly name I pray. Amen. Amen. Well, thank you so much. And Jennifer, does that mean you're staying for both services, Jennifer, again? It was such a good message. <laughs> okay, that's what I thought. Good point. Hey, open your Bibles to Luke chapter 15. Luke chapter 15. Uh, 16 is a great message also, but Luke chapter 15 today. And uh, as we finish up the parables of the lost son, uh, I can't wait for two weeks from now as we begin our Revive Conference. Dr. Joe Liggins is a pastor of First Baptist Church of Marlowe. To be gut level honest with you, I've asked Joe to come and while we desire many to be saved, and we're going to have a great youth night and preteen night and college night that night on the Wednesday night. Really, I've asked him to come to speak to our church and just call our church to all that, all that it can be. So I can't wait to, wait to hear him. For the last two weeks, we have been talking about the lost son and the lost coin and the lost sheep. And last week we talked about, you remember the lost sheep? And if there was 99 sheep and just one was gone, anyone would go and search after that one. And then how they would rejoice when they found it. And Jesus says, that's what happens in heaven when a lost one is saved. And, and then the story about how a lady lost one of her drachmas, basically 10 days of, of living, and she lost one of those, and she searched everywhere. She swept the floor. She looked in every nook and cranny, and she finally found it, how she went to her friends, and she rejoiced over, over finding that, that one. The Bible says that Jesus says that is how it is in heaven, and when I say that what Jesus says is like in heaven, that is a first-hand account. Does that make sense, Balcony? It's a first-hand account that that is really what happens. It's not my summation or my guess is what happened. Jesus has been there. Today, we're going to talk about the, the parable of the lost sons, and I'm going to make that as a plural, and I hope you uh, will grab hold of that and see that, not just the parable of the lost son, but the parable of the, of the lost sons. It begins in chapter 15, uh, verse 11, and let's begin there as we, as we read. He also said... 
a man had two sons. Let's pray together. God, I pray today just very clearly that you will show us which son we are, which son we have been. God, maybe more importantly, which son we are now. God, we take seriously our calling to follow you. And Lord, I pray for those who have not yet received you. And God, I know you're, strong, you're calling them strongly, and I pray today they'll understand that and receive you. And God, I pray for those of us as believers that you continue to call us strongly, and I pray today that we will follow you and continue to, to trust you and live for you. Bless this service, God. May your, your spirit just do something great. And Lord, may I not perform. God, may I preach the word. Thank you, Jesus. In your name we pray. Amen. Growing up in a Southern Baptist church from the age of three, I, I have heard the story of the prodigal son many, many times. And I have to admit to you that while I've always liked the, the story and I've always understood the story about how God seeks after the one who has strayed away, there's one part of that story that, that has really bothered me to a to a great degree, it was not that the wayward one, the one that w wandered far away, wasn't redeemed and rescued and saved and celebrated. It was that the one who didn't run away, who was faithful and, and was uh, a part of the family and was there, that he wasn't celebrated. Something about that just didn't totally add up with me. Like, like, what's wrong? Like, my story and perhaps your story is, hey, throughout my life, well, I have no means been perfect, but I've basically tried to live for the Lord and, and tried to follow Him. And, and what about me? What, what about us? And sometimes a few years ago, God started reminding me and teaching me some things, and I, I hope it helps today. Tim Keller wrote a book called the prodigal God, and, and in it he points out there's really two basic ways, two basic brothers that are very much alike. And first you had the, the brother of, of self-discovery, that, that he took his one-third, being the younger son, one-third of the income, and he said, hey, I don't want to do it your way, I want to do it my way. And they, he wandered off and he squandered his wealth and, and he blew all his money. He ended up hanging out with pigs, which was detestable to the Jews. And even eating, they're willing to eat of their, of their food, which was detestable. That, that was the wayward son. But then we had, a, we had another, another son. That's where I would have fall at it in, in, in my life. Of, this is the son of, of moral conformity, and he actually had his own identity in that, hey, he wanted to fit in with society. He wanted to have his place in society. He, he got two-thirds of the income. He would be in charge of the family if, if something, happened to the, something happened to the father, and so he was just the, the moral conformity of that. But then Keller shares, and God's revealed to me that there is something that we have to get straight. These brothers were very much alike. And God responded to them in very much the same way. They had very similar attitudes. And God gave them very similar opportunities You see, the, the oldest son, I mean, the youngest son, Kenneth Bailey, a theologian in Palestine for over 40 years, he, he's gone back and studied the New Testament. He would say, when that younger son went to his father and demanded one-third of his heritage and, and left, that basically he was looking his father in the eye and he was saying, I wish you were dead. Or you are as good as dead to me. But the oldest son, when he refused to go to the party of the youngest son, and he refused to host the party with his father, 
in all likelihood, the, the people of New Testament days would be picturing this parable about when they had a party that the whole village would have been called, that everybody would have been called in. And when the oldest son refused to go in and refused to take part and refused to help the father, that he was defaming the father. He was ridiculing the, the father. He was slapping the father in the face to the rest of the village. So, which son are you? Which son have you been in your life? Which son are you now? This morning, I want to look at seven different similarities and differences. Some are going to be similar, but some are going to be different how they respond in this story. And let's let God's Spirit work in our lives as, as we read this, this true parable that Jesus gave. It, it didn't literally happen, but the true of, the, of how it could have happened in Israel is very, very true. Luke chapter 15, beginning in, in, in verse 11. He also said, a man had two sons. One of the similarities that we have to realize in this so story is that both these men had the same father. The oldest received two-thirds of the property and would have been in charge if something happened to the father. The, the youngest inherited one-third of, of that and would have had to follow the, the oldest lead. But they had the same father. Church, you know, don't you, that we all are created in the image of God. And from the very beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And, and our earth all started the same way. And, and God desires to be our eternal heavenly Father to this day. We all have the same Father. Sadly, both of these sons were far away from the Father. Now, you're going to have to go with me in the Bible today in Luke 15. So, so have your... Have your brain tuned in here. Let's look how the younger son went far away from the, from the father, verses 11 through 16. He also said, a man had two sons. The, the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the share of the estate I have coming to me. So he distributed the assets to them. Not many days later, the younger son gathered together all he had and traveled to a distant country where he squandered his estate in foolish living. After he had been spent everything, a severe famine struck that country, and he had nothing. Then he went to work for one of the citizens of that country who sent him into his fields to feed pigs. He longed to eat his fill from the carob pods the pigs were eating, but no one would give him any. Both were far away from the father, and the youngest were far, was far away the father. First of all, in distance, he went a long way away. Physical distance, he was a long way away. He went to, to a far distance away, and he squandered his money in wild living. He got to the point that he took on the job he didn't like, and there was a famine. And he got to the point that he hung around pigs, which were detestable to the Jews and he even was willing to eat of their food. This all happened because he was a long way from his father, physically, emotionally, and we know from a religious and spiritual end, he was far away spiritually. But what about the, the older son? Are you saying, Pastor, that, that he was far away from, um, from, from his father? Yeah, yeah, he was. Look at verse 25. It says, now his older son was in the field. Now, I'm not telling you the field was even miles away. So I'm not telling you he was far away physically. But his older son was in the field. As he came near the house, he heard music and dancing. So he summoned one of the servants and asked what these things meant. Your brother is here, he told them, and your father has slaughtered the fattened calf because he has him back safe and sound. Then he became angry and didn't want to go in, but his father came out and, and pleaded with him. But he replied to his father, Look, I've been slaving many years for you, and I've never disobeyed your orders, yet you never gave me a young goat so I could celebrate with my friends. Folks, the oldest son was also far away from his father. He wasn't far away physically. The physical distance wasn't far away, but he was far away emotionally. 
you see here that when he came back, first of all, he heard the sound of music and dancing. So he wasn't attuned to what was going on. But then he went to the, to the servant instead of going to his father. He went to somebody else and said, hey, what is going on? Then it says that he became very angry. And when he had the opportunity to respond to his, um, his father, he said, hey, you have treated me like a slave. I've been slaving for you for many years. He then goes on to call the other son, not his brother, but he says, when this son of yours came. He wasn't even willing to to call his brother a brother, and he wasn't willing to call his father a father. He said, I've been a slave to you. And he wouldn't even go to the father and ask what was going on. So this morning, as we look at this story, we have two sons, and both of them are separated greatly from the father. One of them has squandered in wild living and has ran off and and realizes where they're at. And the other son has, has lived a very normal, moralistic life, but he has no desire to go back to his father. He says, you've treated me like a slave. I'm not even calling you dad. I'm not even calling him brother. Both of them were away from the father. Verse 18 through 20 says, though, there's a difference that the youngest son went to the father. And we go back to the story to the youngest son, and he says, when he came to his senses, verse 18, I'll get up, go to my father, and say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in your sight. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired hands. So he got up and went to his father. But while the son was still a long way off, his father saw him, was filled with compassion. He ran, threw his arms around his neck, and kissed him. So the one son, the wayward son, went back to his father. And he went to the father and he said, hey, these are the things that I'm going to say to my father. I've sinned against you. I'm not worthy to be called your son. Hey, make me like one of your hired hands. He was going back in repentance and desperation and going back to his father. The oldest son didn't go back to his father. You look at verse 28 after he found out about the story of the younger son having the celebration, it says, then he became angry and he didn't want to go in. Huh. Big contrast here. The young son said, I'm going back to my father. The old son, who was just a few yards away, said, I am not going in. Do you realize today, church, you realize today, my friends, that you're one decision away from going back to your father. You're one decision away from being able to go back to God. This young man had been called by many that he had wasted his life and ruined his life and gave away all his money, and he was far away from God. But he made the decision to go back to his father. This young man, an older son, had a great reputation, was a hard worker, was the oldest son. People would have talked highly of him, but he made the decision of, I'm not going into my father. Let's review for a second. Both had the same father. Both were far away from the father, but there was a big difference. The youngest ran back to the father And the oldest one didn't want to go to the Father. He was angry. In salvation and repentance, we must go back to our loving Father. We must not reject going to the Father. That's how a person is saved. We are are saved by understanding that I have to go to the Father who sent His Son Jesus to save me, and I must receive Him as Lord and Savior. I must repent of my sins. I must say, here's my life. I accept your free gift. 
Those of us who are believers, that's how we wander back to the Father. We have to repent. That's exactly what this son did. This son came to the Father and said, I repent before you. I'm coming back. I'm admitting my wrong. Take me back however you'll take me. This prideful older son said, I'm not about to come back to you. Which one are you? Interesting. How did the father respond? Well, the father went to both sons. Look at verse 20 and 21 in the, in the, in the youngest son. It says, so he got up and went to his father. But while the son was still a long way off, the father saw him and was filled with compassion. He ran through his arms around the neck and kissed him. The son said, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in your sight. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. So the father was looking for him and couldn't wait to see him. And, and they met in the middle and they came together. Pastor Steve, our youth pastor, did a strong work on, on this scripture back in, in March and April as he preached on, on, on this scripture. And it's a beautiful testimony about how the young son ran to the father and how father the father ran to him. The father went to both sons, though. See, notice verse, verse 28. Then he became angry, the, the older son. He became angry and didn't want to go in. So his father came out and pleaded with him. Huh. The father was looking a far away, a far away for the younger son, and when he saw him coming, he ran to him. The father was looking a few yards away. The older son wasn't very far away, but he was looking a few yards away. And when the younger son, older son didn't come in, he went out and he pleaded with him. Our God, our Father loves all of us. And he calls all of us to, to repent. And, and the youngest son went to the father and the oldest son didn't want to go in and the father went to both sons, and the young son repented. Look at verse 21. The son said, Father, I've sinned against heaven, and in your sight I'm no longer worthy to, to be called your son. That's exactly what he said he was going to say above, except verse 22 says, but the father told his slaves, quick, the father interrupted the youngest son before he could finish. And he says, come, put a robe on him. Come, get him sandals. Uh, sandals, give him a ring. We're going to celebrate. He couldn't even get the words out. And the father had forgiven him. Praise be to God. But verse 29 and 30 talks about the older son. His father came out and pleaded with the oldest son. But the oldest son replied to his father, Look, I've been slaving many years for you. I have never disobeyed your orders Yet you never gave me a young goat so I could celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours came who has devoured your assets with prostitutes, you slaughtered the fattened calf for him. The father was looking for both sons. He saw one son coming in repentance and he, he received him. He even cut him off from what he was saying. He saw the other son just a few yards away, and he let the other son spew everything out to the father that needed to be said. He didn't cut him off. He didn't tell him to be quiet. He didn't rebuke him. He let him totally speak. And the son tells of his anger with the father and his anger with his brother. You know, the greatest commandment is to love the Lord our God with all our heart, mind, soul, and strength and to love our neighbor as ourself. And this is the opposite that is happening in verse 29 and 30 that this oldest son was not loving God. He was not loving his brother. 
It's interesting to me, though, the father let him say everything. He let him get it out. Can I talk to you a minute as an older, as a fellow older son? I'm a youngest son in real life, but in the image of the oldest son. Some of you have had a really hard life. Some of you have had a death or a breakup or some family situations you're still ashamed and don't want to talk about. Some of you don't understand how when I tried to do this for the Father, it didn't turn out the way I wanted to. Some of you have been disappointed and embarrassed when you've tried to share, serve God. To be honest with you now, you're, you're pretty bitter at God. And you're probably pretty bitter at your fellow brothers and sisters in Christ. I think it's remarkable that the God of the universe, who loves us greatly, still wants to listen to us, still wants to hear our story, still wants to understand that, that uh, uh, we have the right to talk to him. He didn't even interrupt what the oldest son was saying to him. You know, we live on a fallen earth. This isn't our final destination. We're on this airplane ride called Earth, and someday we're going to come down for a final destination for eternity. God didn't promise us that this life is, is easy or good, but I want to tell you I'm sorry for what you've gone through, and I want to tell you I'm sorry if people have hurt you, and, and I'm sorry if you're disappointed in God, but I want to tell you from the bottom of my heart that God is still calling out to you, and he's still reaching out to you, and he still wants to hear you, and he still wants to love you, and he still wants you to come home to him because he's the one true God, and he still cares for you, and he empathizes for you. He still wants to be your father. See, one son realized what he had done, he came back and he repented and the father threw a celebration and the other son the father listened to. He heard, he listened to every word. And then we see what happens next. The father threw a banquet for the youngest son, verse 22 through 24. But the father told, told his slaves, quick, bring out the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger, sandals on his feet. Then bring a fattened calf and slaughter it. And let's celebrate with a feast because his son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. So they began to celebrate. The father had compassion for the son and had love for the son and he celebrated the son. He restored the son to his status. He put the robe and the ring on. He put the sandals on his feet. Slaves went bare feet, barefoot. Children uh, wore sandals. He was showing, hey, this is my son again. He threw a banquet. But look what he does to the oldest son in verse Verse 31, the, the oldest one, ver, son had just spewed to the father. And look how the father responds. Verse 31, first of all, he says, he says, son, son, church, hear this. He doesn't say boy. He doesn't say sinner. He didn't say shame on you. When the son spouted off to the father, public was looking on, the father responded in love by calling him the intimate name of son. Son. Son, you are always with me. Everything I have is yours. To the younger son, he gave him everything because the son repented. He came back. To the oldest son, he still called him son, and he says, I want you to have everything. Everything I have is yours. In other words, what he has, you have. What you have, he can have. I want you to be my son. 
Son, you're always with me. Everything I have is yours. But we had to celebrate and rejoice. We couldn't help ourselves. When the son came home, we had to celebrate and rejoice because his brothers of yours was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. Friends, I see in this a father saying to this son, Son, I want to celebrate with you too. I want to link arms with you too. Everything I have is yours also. Come, repent, come back. We've got to celebrate. We'll celebrate you also. Verse 32 says, celebration occurred with the youngest son. We had to celebrate and rejoice because his brother of yours was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. And the Bible says that celebration happens in, in heaven when one lost one comes to the, to the father. It happened in the lost sheep and the lost coin and, and now the lost son. But what happened to the oldest son? Well, look with me at verse 33 and and 34, verse 32 talks about the youngest son. Verse 33 and 34. Oh, there's not a verse 33 and, and 34. Hmm. You know why? Because we don't know how that story ends. We don't know how the oldest son responded. Jesus was leaving this with a dramatic moment as he was calling the Pharisees and the scribes, as he was calling them to say, this is you, how will you respond to me? You've lived your life in legalism and laws and moralistic and pleasing other people. And I want you to know that you can have all of my kingdom also, but the choice is yours. Church today, you might be far away from God. You might have squandered your spiritual wealth. You might have ran far and long away from God. Our God is looking for you, and He can't wait to run to you. But I believe there could be many that say this. I've done my duty for God through all these years. But to be honest, I'm bitter and I'm angry. I'm tired and I'm angry. The father said, talk to me. The father says, I still love you. The father says, come home. The youngest son repented. The oldest son needed to repent. I'm not going to sit here and say today if this rep oldest son represented a saved man or, or not a saved person. I can make an argument either way. But let me tell you both ways. If you've never received Christ Jesus as your Lord and Savior, you might have lived a wild life on your own, did your own thing, or you might have lived an ethical, moral, fit-in-the-box life but you've never received the Father through Jesus Christ. The Father is still ready to celebrate with you. And he's saying to you today, come, come and receive me as Lord and Savior. Come and turn your life over to me. Come, everything I have is yours. Some would be this way and some would be that way, but God knows. To others of you, you are believers in Christ Jesus, and, and you know you are, but you've been living your last few years running away from God, or, or you've been living your last few, few years just doing deeds and responsibilities, and you're a believer, but all you've been doing is being a slave to God. God is saying to you, I've got such a better life for you. Come. Come repent. Come home. Come celebrate. Everything I have is yours. This year, our theme of our church is welcome to the family. And when God says to these two sons, everything I have is yours, that means there'll never be a time that God will ever leave us or forsake us. There'll never be a time that we'll be on our own. On every bad day, he'll be there, and on every good day, he'll be there. 
He promises eternity in heaven. But you have to be a son. And if you are a son and you're not following him, you need to repent. Because it's ruining your life. You can still be his child, but it's ruining your life. Would you pray with me? I asked you the first of the message, and just which, which son are you? And maybe you say, oh, I'm some of both, or I'm neither one. Or, but here's a real question. Are you running from God or running to God? Here's a couple things, and we're going to stand and sing for our invitation. Sing a couple songs and then... Celebrate baptism, but, but don't, don't, let the, don't let the Spirit, don't let the Spirit, uh, don't quench the Spirit. Listen to Him. Don't let anything distract you right now. The Father is seeking you. He's looking at you right now. He knows you better than you know yourself. And are you running to Him? Or are you standing next to him saying, I'm not going to come to you? This is much bigger than our church. Or You know how much courage that youngest son had to have? Boy, he humbled himself and he came back to the father. The very best life you can have is to go to the one who created you, who made you, who knows what is best for you. His name is Jesus. Jesus made you in his image. He knows you sin, but he still wants you, and you have to come to him and receive him as Lord and Savior. In a moment, we're going to stand and sing, and Pastor Steve, Pastor Kurt, Pastor Reed, and I are going to be here, and as we are... As we are here, we want to help you. There'll be ladies here to, to visit with you. And just like the son ran to the father, if you need Jesus today, you're so surprised that you know God's calling you right now. You can't believe it. You just showed up for church, but you know he is. Courageously come and say, I need Jesus Christ as my Lord and King and Savior. Maybe you've already told him that, and, but come and share. We need to celebrate with you. Be courageous. Others of you are believers in Christ, but you've been wandering away from God. Maybe you've been like a slave doing your duty, or maybe you've, you've been wandering away and, and, and you know it. But today you say, man, I'm missing it. I need to come and repent. I need to publicly get on my knees, and I need to publicly ask for prayer. And that one son was so close right next to the Father. He could have had everything. And I don't know how he responded. But I do know how you can respond. You're so close to the Father. You know he's calling you. Say yes to him. Hey, perhaps God's calling you to join this church or some other decision. That's great. We're not quenching the spirit on that. Let's stand to our feet and let me pray. Lord, I pray that I have done nothing to keep anyone from following you today. And I pray that your Holy Spirit, who is God, has spoken. And Lord, I want to pray for those who feel like slaves to you. Maybe they're believers. Or, or maybe they're not, but God, they feel like slaves to you. And God, they're doing their duty, but they have bitterness and anger in their life. God, I pray that they'll be set free today by, by just repenting and turning back to you or coming to know you. God, I pray for those who realize their way of life has been wrong. And God, they know you're looking for them. I pray that they'll just come and we'll celebrate what you've done. Give them freedom. Give them courage. God, I thank you that we can call you Father and that everything you have is ours. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you for your amazing grace. It's in your name we pray. Amen. God bless you as you respond.
He's looking. He's calling. He's seeking. Say yes to the Father right now.
is found in the book of Isaiah. Say to the cowardly, be strong, do not fear. Here is your God. Vengeance is coming. God's retribution is coming. He will save you. And then the eyes of the blind will be opened, the ears of the deaf unstopped, and then the lame will leap like a deer, and the tongue of the mute will sing for joy. For water will gush in the wilderness and streams in the desert. The parched ground will become a pool of water, and the thirsty land springs of water. Oh, you unravel me with a melody, and you surround me with a song of deliverance from my enemies till all my Now I'm no longer a slave to fear. No, I am a child of God. No, I'm no longer a slave to fear. I am a child of God. This great, great truth. Oh, from my mother's womb, God, you have chosen me, and love has called my name. Now I've been born again into your family. I'm no longer a slave to fear. Oh, I am a child of God. No, oh, I'm no longer a slave to fear. Oh, I am a child of God. Let's proclaim it, church. I'm no longer. child of God. He's running to his church. Now you split the sea so I could walk right through it. My fears are drowned in perfect love. And you rescued me so I could stand and sing. I am a child God. Proclaim it. Oh, I am a child of God. Hallelujah. I am a child of God. Praise you, Lord. Now I'm no longer a slave. No longer a slave to fear. Oh, I am a child of God. Now just your voice. 
Jesus church I'm no would you bow for prayer? Ushers, would you come forward now as we prepare to take up our offerings and our tithes? Father God, we can call you Father because of the work of your son, Jesus Christ, paying the penalty for our sins upon that cross. And through the power of the Holy Spirit, who raised Christ Jesus from the dead, we can be made sons and daughters of the Most High God. So, Lord, all of our praise belongs to you. All of our thanksgiving and the overflow of these generous hearts belongs to you. Thank you for calling us by name. Thank you for making us your sons, your daughters, together the people of God. And, Lord, now as we give of ourselves, as we give of these tithes and these offerings, may you be glorified. May your kingdom come and your will be done here on earth, just as it is in heaven. Jesus, we love you. We pray that you would continue to form us into your image today. In your name, amen. Thank you, church. You can be seated. Amen, amen. Just a few announcements before we observe a couple of, uh, a few, or really a handful of, of baptisms this morning. As Griff mentioned, uh, we're two weeks away from our Revive Conference that's going to be held here uh, at the church. Two weeks away. That's that's absolutely crazy. We've been talking about this for uh, a month and a half, two months or so, something like that. And, and uh, so we're almost there. Continue praying for us in that as we prepare. Continue praying for Joe Ligon uh, as he prepares uh, his, uh, teaching and worship time and all those things. Um, but uh, but make sure that you're well aware of tw- the September 23rd uh, through the 25th. Some really cool things that are happening. also want to make a mention of our Wednesday night of that week. Week. Uh, we have a fifth through sixth grade uh, student and, and also college night, specific night on that Wednesday, uh, the 26th at 6 p.m. Uh, prizes, giveaways, uh, a time of worship, uh, a gospel that we will be presenting clearly. Uh, and so we want to challenge our students, challenge our college students, fifth and sixth graders. Man, it'll be a night to bring somebody alongside with you that needs to hear the gospel clearly. Uh, a very, very driven evangelistic night. And so that's going to be a sweet night of, of worship and, and a fun uh, there as well. Um, there's a co-ed Bible study that begins tonight at 530 if you're interested in that. Um, we can have some more information for you there in the bulletin. Also this Wednesday morning for, for you ladies in the room. Um, Wednesday morning at 9.30, uh, there is a study that begins this week, and uh, you want to make sure that you're there if you're available for that time. Um, also, I, I talked to our college students this morning about the Pictor Directory. Now, they're pretty excited uh, about our Pictor Directory coming up. I mean, they really, really are. And so we want to make sure that you're excited about that as well. Uh, that's coming up. You can go online right now to our website and, uh, and click on our Pictor Directory tab. Find out a slot that you can figure out um, where you know what fits for you to come and take your picture for that directory. Uh, don't let college students just be in that directory. We want across the board everybody in that. So we'll, we'll be excited about that. We're going to observe some baptisms for a little bit. You guys be in prayer as we, as we do so. We are privileged this morning to have the opportunity to have four, four of our young people to be baptized and this is Seeker and Jenna Samara. Uh, Seeker, you're 13 when you came to know Christ as Lord and Savior. Is that right? Yes. Amen. Jenna, you also accepted Christ this year. Is that right? Yes, sir. Awesome. Hey, I want to invite you as family members of them, as friends of them, part of the youth group, to stand. Others who know his family, stand in honor of this exciting time. Seeker upon your public profession and faith in Christ Jesus as your personal Lord and Savior, and now in obedience to our Lord's command, 
I baptize you in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Buried with him in baptism. Grace to walk in the name of God. We invite you to stand in honor of Jenna's baptism also. Jenna, upon your public profession of faith in Christ Jesus as your personal Lord and Savior, now in obedience to our Lord's command, I baptize you in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Bury with him a baptism. Grace to walk in the name of God. also have the privilege today of baptizing a, a brother and a sister also. This is T.J. Francis, and this is Ellie Francis. And Ellie, have you accepted Christ Jesus as your Lord and Savior? Yes. Awesome. Praise God. T.J., have you accepted Christ as your Lord and Savior? Yes. Amen. We praise God for that. Uh, I want to invite you to stand in honor of Ellie's, Ellie's baptism right now. Ellie, upon your public profession of faith in Christ Jesus as your personal Lord and Savior, now in obedience to our Lord's command, I baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Buried with him in baptism. Raised to walk in the new life. Hey, this is TJ, and uh, so we're going to go baptize him, and if you'd like to say family, friends, go ahead and keep standing. So TJ, because of your profession and Christ's obedience and following baptism, I baptize you in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Buried with Christ in baptism, raised to walk in the newness of life. All righty. Amen, amen. Church family, I want to introduce you, Cheyenne. You guys come on ahead. Oh, whole, whole family, come on up real quick. Cheyenne wants you to know that she has asked Jesus to be her personal Lord and Savior. If you rejoice with that, let us, let us know this morning. We will be, uh, we'll be having Emily and Shelly follow up with her, but the booklet and baptism and all that fun stuff here in the near future. Mark, would you, uh, would you come pray us out real quick? As he, uh, after, as he finishes up, would you come by and, and, and give this uh, family a hug on the neck and uh, tell them that you're praying for him? Mark, go ahead. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, thank you for today. Thank you for this wonderful uh, group of people, Lord, and the, one, the baptisms, Lord, and this one that's going to be... Uh, accepted into uh, the Lord's house, and also, Lord, just thank you for all the many blessings you have given us. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.